Simulations and first-person shooter video games are not just designed for military training or for private citizens to play on the consoles. Increasingly, they are also designed for recruitment purposes. In 2002, for instance, the Pentagon released America's Army, a free-of-charge, state-of-the-art video game developed purely to attract young men and women into military service. In its initial version, the game featured two parts. One training simulation called Soldier, which includes a boot camp, and another, more traditional first-person shooter game called Operations, in which players work in online teams to carry out missions. The America's Army video game got rave reviews, strangely enough. You would think that it would be panned by the critics, but its production values were high, its story values were high, its playability was just top-notch. America's Army has come to be kind of a permanent fixture now in the military's arsenal and a permanent fixture in military consumer culture. It cost only about seven and a half million dollars to produce at first, but uh, by 2005 or so they had about seven uh, million registered users. So it's been a remarkable success. In terms of creating a favorable image of the Army, um, it's got massive penetration into consumer culture. It's reaching the people it wants to reach. And this was deliberate. Because of its military campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq, the US military faced a recruitment gap. More soldiers were needed. And the principal target group was 16 to 18 year old teenagers. And what does this target group like? Video games. That's why the military developed America's Army. Yes, it's a free online first person shooter video game, but it ultimately serves as an interactive recruitment poster. This is not where the story ends, however. On the back of the success of America's Army, the US military in 2008 decided to further experiment with finding new solutions to regenerating its ranks. The key focus was on substituting dreary recruitment offices located in urban ghettos for exciting yet militarized video arcades in popular suburban shopping malls. The result was the Army Experience Center, a physical simulation hub at the Franklin Mills Mall in Philadelphia. Modeled on the Apple Store's soft cell environment, the Army Experience Center offered teenagers the possibility to fly 3D helicopter gunships through the mountains of Afghanistan or to ride armored vehicles through the streets of Baghdad, all under the supervision of the armed forces and recruitment officers. Both America's Army and the Army Experience Center expose the porous boundaries between 21st century military recruitment and first-person shooter game culture. What we see is a new constellation of various media as they remap traditional lines between battlefront and home front. In this process, we see that various genres, once thought to be discrete, are now forging new and strange alliances in what is called the mime net. The distinctions by which we've traditionally understood war, the distinction between home front and battlefield, between civilian and soldier, between the commercial sphere and the military sphere, between journalism and actual military activity, all of these categories, these distinctions, have become less relevant in an age of the interactive presentation of conflict. And in some ways, the introduction of the entertainment element of MimeNet um, is an indication that public opinion matters more now than ever. And managing the stories that circulate in our entertainment industries are of primary importance. Focusing on the MimeNet gives us a deep insight into an emerging, brave, new networked world. A networked world where blockbuster films video games and simulations cross the boundaries between militaries, the defense industry, Hollywood, toy makers and the commercial gaming sector. A networked world where the entire spectrum of the media today is mobilized for warfare in the information age. 
prior to the internet, war became refashioned as a spectacle to allow the citizen to passively consume and indulge in the sight of war. Here we were citizen spectators. But more recent media trends have produced a different type of citizen altogether. The virtual citizen soldier who is productively integrated into war's cyber structure. Interactivity is the new primary media mode. An important boundary has been breached when the spectacle gave away to interactivity. And though war today positions the citizen as interactive participant rather than passive consumer, this does not mean that the citizen necessarily plays a more participatory role in democratic life. And this raises important questions. How is our relationship to war being produced through films and video games, in both military and civilian spheres? How, in this interactive sphere of war, is violence portrayed? What is shown? What is not shown? And do first-person shooters suck us deep into the question of the how of killing at the expense of the why of killing? What is revealed and what is concealed about the reality of war when we dive deep into this new interactive cyber battlefield.